Um, we're thankful that so many of you have expressed interest in this topic and have chosen to join us this morning. We understand that everyone has busy schedules, so we're glad that you've chosen to spend um, a couple of hours this morning with our project team. Uh, my name is Tana Marie Rogers, and I'm the director at the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve based in Falmouth, and we are a project partner on the study that you'll be hearing about this morning, along with several other wonderful um, partner organizations, which I'll introduce more fully. And before we go deeper into the session this morning, I want to just introduce my co-host um, who will be working with me behind the scenes to sort of run all the logistics for this webinar. And that is Lori uh, Tompkins. Lori, could you give, give a wave? Everybody Good morning, can see everyone. Um, and so Lori and I will be managing uh, all the, the behind the scenes um, stuff, as it were, for this webinar to go forward. Should you have any um, technical difficulties or questions that you just want to direct to us, please feel free to do that in the chat box. Um, at this point in our lives where we have been doing so many virtual interactions, I am going to assume that most people are familiar with the Zoom platform and can manage that. But just in case people are so new to that, there's anyone on the line, you should be able to see some controls at the bottom of your screen if you click there. Um, and that's where you can find like a chat box and different ways that you could interact with us. And the chat box is one you want to um, click on. It looks like a little bubble. Um, and so you can click on that to direct a question or a comment at the appropriate time during the meeting. Um, this webinar will be recorded um, so that we can have that information available later on for people who just were not able to make it today or for your reference for those who are on the line. So you can rest assured that that will be made available on the Wakoit Bay Reserves website uh, at a later date and we will send out an email to let people know when that's available. So just want to make everybody aware that we will be recording um, the session this morning. I wanted to just set the stage for what the work that you will be hearing about today um, in just a minute or two before I hand over to different team members to walk us through um, specific aspects of the project. Um, and to set the stage, I want you to just um, think back maybe three, four, five years ago um, where conditions were um, on the Cape in terms of water quality. Um, some of that hasn't changed, so the scenario is probably the same today. But we were at a point where communities were really looking for, and still are, looking for solutions to our nitrogen qual um, remediation um, interest because coastal waters have been impacted by nitrogen pollution and there is a lot of pressure to come up with solutions that will work and that will be efficient and that will be cost effective. And uh, so the Wakoit Bay Reserve, along with the partners that you'll be hearing about today, um, uh, had the opportunity to apply for funding to look at a project that where we could tailor this project to address questions that were coming from the management community, not just um, scientifically interesting questions, um, although they, they were as well, but questions that could help to link the science to management decision making. And so at, in the context where we began to do this study and where we applied for the funding, there was a lot of interest growing in the, in the world of using shellfish aquaculture as one of the options that communities could be looking at to help address this problem. And so we designed a study that we that used a collaborative research approach. And by that, I mean, we were very deliberate and intentional about setting up this project to link the science with management. And so to do that, we brought together science investigators, we brought together end users, people who could potentially apply the science in their work later down the road, and our representatives of an end user community of decision makers that are working locally on this issue, um, as well as different collaborators and stakeholders with an interest in this topic and who could advise the project team um, so that we're, we were setting up the study to have an applied science focus and to bring together these partners to work together from concept through um, project implementation through application at the end. So that's a layer um, that is on top of how you're going to be hearing about how the work was structured and how we went about that. The funding organization that gave us the money to work on this is called the National Estuarine Research Reserve Science Collaborative. They fund research at research reserves like the Wakoit Bay Reserve. There are 29 other research reserves around the country that work in coastal areas 
working coastal, coastal communities with community partners to address topics like water quality and, and other priority coastal management issues. And so that's where we sort of stepped into this um, project. Um, and you're going to be hearing a lot about uh, sort of how it's structured. My job right here is just to sort of introduce you to the quick framework and the context within which we started the work. I do want to take a moment and just introduce our project team. And you're going to be hearing from some of these members today, not all, but I wanted to point out who they were. Daniel Rogers, who is a project PI and who is um, at Stonehill College. Virginia Edgecombe, um, who's at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, Paris Kevi, Vivian Mara, who's also with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in, in, um, in Dr. Edgecombe's lab, um, Chuck Martinson and Christina Lovely, who are with the town of Falmouth, um, and then Eric and Sia Karplus with Sciencewares, a consulting um, firm that also helped in the initial setup and, and sort of concepts phases of this work. And then we have a team of staff from the Wakoit Bay Reserve, Joan Muller, Education Coordinator, Nancy Church, also working in the Education Department, Jim Rasman, our Stewardship Coordinator, um, Pryor, and myself, who worked um, and gave input from the Wakoit Bay Reserve side. And then we had end user advisors that were um, we that we asked to be a part of this and to give um, input, um, constructive, give us direct feedback, help us to sort of shape how we set up this project. And they gave very helpful and instructive guidance, especially at the early end of this project, the Cape Cod Commission, the Department of Environmental Protection and the Division of Marine Fisheries. And then we had a host of students who worked um, as sort of the labor force helping with all the field work, as well as a host of volunteers who worked with setting up um, the, the, the aquaculture farm. So I just wanted to sort of set up who the players were behind the scenes. Um, for the rest of the morning, what you're going to be hearing is we're going to be telling you a story of this particular project, um, tying back to the rationale about why we did it, and then also stepping through, you'll be hearing sort of two halves of the story, but they're very connected. The shellfish farming aspect of things and uh, the gear that was chosen, the, the whole experiment with using and growing those animals and what we learned from that process, as well as sort of the science and investigation, the, the big questions that we were trying to address and their management um, links and what the, the key take home messages were from that. So we're going to dovetail those two aspects of the story together with the farming and the science results and then making the link to what we see as potential management application. So this is one study and we know that there's always more to learn as science progresses, um, but we believe that there are some interesting findings that could have application both in the Cape Cod context and beyond for communities that are looking at, you know, um, using aquaculture as part of their integrated comprehensive um, water quality management plans, as well as for shellfish growers who are thinking about setting up farming with nitrogen remediation as a potential um, benefit involved as well. And at the end, we'll wrap up with we'll just sharing with you some of the project resources that we're providing and working on to help to share with the decision maker community and the science community to continue advancing um, both the scientific knowledge and the way we apply science in the real world to address coastal management problems. So I'll tee those up at the end. Um, uh, one of the things that we're going to try to do today is really engage you. We have a two hour session. You'll be hearing several presentations, but we also want to engage you through some polling. We, I'm going to invite you to use the chat box today um, to direct your questions with a lot of people on the line. We're not going to be able to sort of invite people to get off mute. We don't want that to become a little bit too messy to manage. So use the chat box um, at the appropriate times to direct your questions to the speakers or the hosts, and we will take those questions and get through as many of them as we can. For those that we cannot get through, we're going to commit to still collect those questions and, and have our speakers work on them behind the scenes and send you a response. So um, we're not sure we'll be able to get through all the questions, but we're going to do our best. And so to help us do that, we ask, we're going to ask from now that you, as you frame your questions in your mind and you write them down, that we try to sort of direct those questions to the topic at hand and to the speakers that you just heard from so that it can be very coordinated and tightly linked to um, the presentations that you heard. Um, 
Now, I just wanted to take us to a, a polling to get us kicked off and our brains sort of warmed up to hear about uh, shellfish farming and also a lot of science today and a lot of talk about nitrogen and the nitrogen cycle. And uh, I am going to bring up two polling questions and I'm going to ask you to quickly participate and in, in selecting an answer choice and we'll see where that goes. So these are just sort of warm up questions to just gauge your understanding of um, some of the topics around that we're going to touch on this morning. Allow me to just bring up the first poll. Can everyone see that poll? Yes, Tana Marie. Yes. So if participants could just go ahead and start logging your answer choices. I will share the poll in a minute. There's poll results. We have a lot of people in the line, so I'm just going to wait a minute. I can see that we only have about a third people are logging in their answers very quickly. So just give it another couple seconds. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just go ahead and end this poll and let's see where we land in terms of people's answer to this question. How do oysters help to promote the cycling of excess nutrients in coastal water bodies? And so we have just about 47%, um, just about 50% of people think it's um, answer choice number two, the oysters eat microscopic plants that use the nutrients in the water to grow. Um, we have about a quarter of the audience that thinks the, the oysters absorb nutrients from the water like a sponge directly into their shell and muscle tissue. And we have actually almost another quarter that thinks all of the above and no one selected that they absorb nutrients directly from the air. So the correct answer would be um, the one that's highlighted in orange with the most choices. The oysters eat microscopic plants that use the nutrients in the water to grow. Um, so I'm gonna go on to um, question number two. Let me just pull up that question. So this question is just a sort of an interesting one about what oysters can do. Um, we know that they're filter feeders. Um, how many gallons of water can one oyster filter in a day? What do you think is the best sort of representation of how well these animals can work at doing that job? Almost there. We'll just give it another couple seconds before we end the poll. So I'm going to end it here and let's see what those results look like. So it looks like the majority of our audience believes it's up to about 50 gallons. Um, you know, another quarter or so, I think about up to 10 gallons. And then we see with the spread of answers below that. Um, so you guys are very um, knowledgeable about oysters. It is up to about 50 gallons a day. And the answer is up to, so I guess all of the other answer choices could also be accurate. But it just it's just to emphasize the point that they can do a phenomenal job in terms of how much um, one oyster can filter a day. So they're very, very important animals to the ecosystem. They're doing a tremendous um, sort of work with that filter feeding capability. And we're going to hear more about how that connects with solutions that we're trying to address for um, both growing oysters, as well as dealing with our nitrogen and water quality um, problems. I'm going to stop sharing the results here. And thank you for for participating in those warm up, um, like I said, audience polling questions to get our minds nice and active. And so now what I'm going to do is is have a chance to introduce 
our first uh, speaker. Um, the pre like I said, for this morning, we're going to be hearing from several presenters. And how we've divided the webinar session is for the first component of it, you'll be hearing about the setup. Um, actually, no, I got ahead of myself. We're gonna be hearing a project overview. Um, first, just to give you that backdrop of what the project looks like, how it was shaped, why we, the quick questions that we, that we uh, attempted to answer. And then after that, we'll go to shellfish farming results. And then from there, we'll go to sort of the science investigations that were also done. And so um, to do that, I am going to invite Dan Rogers, who is a project PI, to um, share his screen. And Dan is going to walk us through that setting the stage project overview um, context piece for this morning's webinar. Dan, I invite you to take control and share your screen. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Okay. So I thank you all for coming out this morning uh, to listen to our talk, to have a bunch of educators talk to you. And being educators, the first thing we do is we greet you with a quiz. Uh, you guys did really well in the quiz though, so you should be happy about that. I wanna stress again that this is a collaborative effort. We were funded by uh, the Science Collaborative out of NOAA, the National National Research Reserve. Uh, and that's our funding source. The whole goal of this funding source is to not do science as we normally do science, where we write a proposal, scientists write a proposal, we do the work and we publish in scientific journals for other scientists to read, but to take that federal money do the same work, but then make it available to people who can use that knowledge for a practical purpose. And we start that process at the very beginning. So from the very nascent idea that, that came about, it was a collaboration between my lab group at Stonehill College, uh, Dr. Jenny Edgecombe's group at Woods Hole Oceanographic, and the town of Falmouth. Uh, the town of Falmouth are really the practitioners of what we're gonna talk about today. They're the experts in putting the farms in, growing the shellfish, uh, to nice healthy sizes. I'm the chemist, uh, Dr. Edgecombe is the microbiologist. And what we're trying to do is as a team understand what's happening in the ecosystem when we put these animals in place. We also had the collaboration of Wakoit Bay National Estuarian Research Reserve. Uh, this is a mouthful. So from now on, we're just gonna call it Webner. Uh, and they are really the, the another end member user. They have an outreach that is education to primary schools, teachers, but also not reach to uh, other end users like uh, town committees and businessmen and things like that. And so with the end users and the scientists working together from the origin of the study, we're hoping that we can really make an impact with the data we're about to present to you. So I wanna start off this morning with a question. When you imagine a coastal community, something like Cape Cod where we're from, what do you think of? Some people think of beaches, swimming, fishing, shell fishing. Some people think of lighthouses, sunsets, the scenic view that they have. Some people think of Main Street, the small mom and pop stores that you like to walk down the street and just visit, window browse, maybe buy some ice cream at the local ice cream shop. All these things are what drive the economy in a place like Cape Cod or really any coastal community. And what links all these things is a healthy coastal ecosystem. If we lose the health of the ecosystem, all of this, with the exception of the sunsets, will fall apart. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the ecosystem today. Principally about the ecosystem is I want to talk about how human activity has impacted the ecosystem. All of our major cities and large population centers are located on the coast or on inland waterways. And so the image to the right, what you see is a image of the earth at night uh, and you see all the lights lighting up. So you can see the Eastern seaboard of the US really clearly. You can very clearly pick out LA and San Francisco on the West Coast. Um, and you can pick out Europe, you can pick out uh, parts of Asia. So you can see all these major population cities and what you ought to notice is that they're all right on the coast. 
About 40% of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast, about 62 miles of the coast. Everything we do in that region affects the coast directly. We've done things like overfishing, dramatically changing population structures of our native habitats. We've destroyed habitats. We've changed habitats. All this has a huge impact on the health of the coastal ecosystem. What we're going to talk about today is something not as, um, maybe not as tangible as overfishing, but has a similar impact. We're going to be talking about how much nitrogen we're putting into the water systems and what that is doing to our coastal waters, how it's impairing its health. And so if you think back to college biology, you remember that we told you in biology class that nitrogen is required for life. And that's true, it is required for life. Here's a generic cell. Again, I'm a chemist, so my cells are square. Uh, and what I am highlighting here is that these are the major classes of compounds within a cell. And within those curly brackets right there, all these types of compounds, the proteins, the RNA, the DNA, so the information storage and the processing compounds all contain nitrogen. And that accounts for about 20% of the cell weight of any cell that we have. That's your cell, that's my cell, that's an oyster cell, all the cells. So that's a lot of nitrogen that's required for life. Good thing is nitrogen's everywhere. The breath you just took contained about 80% nitrogen, but that nitrogen isn't really available to life. We need nitrogen in a specific form for life to be able to incorporate it. And very few plants can move the nitrogen from the atmosphere into biomass. Well, once we get it into a form of biomass, turns out we humans are fantastic engineers. We saw this problem. We can't get enough nitrogen to grow enough biomass. Let's fix this. So in the early part of the 20th century, we came up with a process to move nitrogen from the atmosphere into a compound that could be taken up by plants and could feed our crops. And so in this graph on the top right, this black line is human, po human population. And you can see this dramatic spike in human population starting in the early 1900s, early to mid 1900s. The important point here is this point right here. This is the start of humans using something called the Haber-Bosch process. And the Haber-Bosch process is an industrial way to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere in a form that plants can take up. This allows us to produce fertilizers to stimulate crop growth. It allows us to, to, put, to make fertilizers to stimulate your grass growing, to make your golf courses green. And what you can see is once we started stimulating, uh, once we started fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere using this process, this grayish line is the amount of fixed nitrogen, available nitrogen in the world. And you can see that climbs dramatically. And it's not a coincidence that these two lines look remarkably similar. We can support some 7 billion people on the world because we can put enough nitrogen into the world to feed those 7 billion people. So let's zoom in on what happens with this nitrogen. Here's my uh, drawing of a cityscape. Again, I'm a chemist, not an artist. And so we have houses, we have some, uh, maybe some businesses here. Every activity you do affects the coastal ecosystem. So the activity we're primarily concerned about are nitrogen producing activities. And so when you use the bathroom, when you flush that toilet, you're actively putting nitrogen into the ground. It's a natural excretionary process. If you put fertilizer on your lawn, you're putting nitrogen into the ground. And what you end up with is all these different sized nitrogen plumes in the ground. Well, there's also water in the ground and that groundwater will move towards the coastal environment. And so anything we put into that groundwater, this nitrogen that we put in that groundwater, will start to move towards the coast. And so once it moves towards the coast, it will come out in our coastal bays. This is an image of Cape Cod from Google Maps. And what I want you to notice on this image is this green halo down on the south end of Cape Cod. You can see it up here by Wellfleet. Uh, and it's all here as well. You just can't see it quite as well because of the currents. This halo that we see coming off of the boundaries of Cape Cod is 
plants blooming in the waters due to this added nutrient, this added nitrogen to the coastal waters directly from the groundwater sources, some coming just washing in on the rain. But all of this is being stimulated by anthropogenic human produced nitrogen. Too much nitrogen is a bad thing. If we start getting too much nitrogen, we start growing plants in the ocean and plants in the ocean are not giant trees, but little microscopic one-celled organisms. And what happens is that they grow and they die or they're consumed by whatever grazes on them. And when you burn that plant, the same way you and I burn a plant when we eat a salad, you consume oxygen. So when the bloom happens and the plants die, oxygen is lost from the environment. If you lose the oxygen, you can also lose biodiversity. Most of the animals you are familiar with are dependent on oxygen to survive. If there's no oxygen around, the fish that can leave will leave, the things that are sessile and can't leave will die. It's also detrimental to economics. If you're a mom and pop business owner on Main Street and people are coming to the Cape to go swimming on our nice beaches and our beaches turn green and slimy, your pocketbook is gonna get hurt, right? So this is a, a widespread problem that we need to deal with. Now, again, I said I'm a chemist, so I'm gonna talk chemistry to you. I wanna describe three ways in which we can remove nitrogen from the system. But I wanna start with how nitrogen gets into the system first. So when we use nitrogen, we use it in this form up here. We call this ammonium. And this is the form of nitrogen that enters your leaching field or, or leaves your house, leaves your body. Uh, and is the organic form of nitrogen. Very quickly in the environment, in the presence of oxygen, we can move this nitrogen to a species called nitrate down here. What's important about nitrate is that it's relatively unreactive in an oxygenated environment. If there's oxygen around, it just sort of sits there. But it's not held by anything, so it moves to the environment pretty quickly. This is the species that can move through the groundwaters into the coastal bays. This species is also available for plants. Plants can take this up readily. To remove this nitrate, we have to go through three different, we're gonna talk about three different processes that do not use oxygen. In fact, they're often limited by oxygen. The first process I want to talk about is called denitrification. Denitrification takes this oxygen and removes it from the nitrogen compound, producing ultimately N2 gas. And this dinitrogen gas, N2 gas, is the same nitrogen that's in the atmosphere. So if we can move this nitrate to this gas, we've removed that nitrogen pollution. We've put the nitrogen back where it started from. This is an important process. It's carried out by many bacteria. And I also wanna note that you see these different intermediates here we know the genes, the enzymes that run these processes. We'll come back to that later uh, today. The second process I want to talk about competes with this process, but also produces this dinitrogen end member, and we call this Anamox. Anamox stands for anaerobic oxidation of ammonium. And what it does is it takes one of the intermediates of that denitrification process and some of the ammonia that hasn't been oxidized yet, hasn't been changed to nitrate yet, combines them and forms dinitrogen gas. Again, this is a great way to remove nitrogen from the ecosystem and put it back in the atmosphere. So we have these two processes, denitrification and anamox, that can remove nitrogen from the ecosystem. But there's a third process that we're gonna talk about later today. And it's called dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium, or we'll refer to it as DNRA. What DNRA is, it is a reverse of this fixing pathway. And so we're pushing this mobile species back to ammonium. This can lead to a retention of nitrogen in the environment and not remove it to the atmosphere. And so what we're going to be talking about in a little bit is how do we balance these three different processes. Denitrification and anamox lead to nitrogen removal and DNRA leads to some nitrogen retention. We're gonna be talking about that both uh, chemically and enzymatically in a little bit. How do oysters play into this? Well, I told you earlier that the nitrogen entering the coastal zone 
is going to be taken up by microscopic plants. It's hard to harvest microscopic plants. It's easy to harvest corn. You can get a thresher, drive over it, and take it all out. But for plants, we need something that will gather the plants up. That's where our oysters come in. Oysters are phenomenal filter feeders. You saw earlier they can filter up to 50 uh, gallons of water per day per oyster. So if you have half a million oysters in there, quick do the math, that's, someone said it, 20 billion gallons of water. Um, so we can process a ton of water uh, in a bay with oysters. What these oysters do is they select, uh, they, they pull all the plants out of the surface waters. Some of them they, they eat as food and they might incorporate that nitrogen and that biomass into their tissue or their shell. And some of it, the stuff that they don't want to eat as food, they package up into these tight pellets called pseudofeces and they eject them with their feces and it makes a nice dense packet that moves that nitrogen and carbon down to the sediments. Sediments are important because remember, I told you that, oops, wrong way. There we go. I told you that these three processes that cycle the nitrogen in the environment are anaerobic. They can't happen in the presence of oxygen. Well, in the environment where we naturally lose oxygen is in the sediment column. So if we can get this nitrogen and carbon to the sediments, we can now invoke these microbial driven processes to remove the nitrogen from the ecosystem. So our experiment was uh, fairly simple in design. We went and we asked one of our local suppliers, what are the three most common ways to grow oysters in our uh, community? And we were told that the floating bag, this oyster grow midwater system and bottom cages were, were the three most uh, utilized methods. And so we want to look at these three systems all in the same hydro hydrographic regime, meaning the same water type, the same water chemistry, the same bottom types, so that the only difference as best we can control would be the farming method. And we want to look and see how nitrogen is removed from the sediments with these three systems in place. And we'll learn about these three systems from Chuck in just a moment. So the big questions we had here were, are there differences in the oyster growth between gear types? If we're growing oysters for maximal growth rather than maximal nitrogen removal, it doesn't matter which gear type we use. We're gonna end up playing these games, optimizing between oyster growth and nitrogen removal. Does the nitrogen release, we're gonna call this flux in a little bit, uh, from the sediment pinge on what's happening in the oysters above? And is that amount of release a big enough of a release to be included in management planning. We also want to look at the microbial communities under the, under the oyster uh, aquaculture systems because we wanna make sure we're not changing our system from something that's unnatural. We wanna keep the natural community there. We just want it to do what it normally does faster. And so we're gonna look at that and we're gonna look at what the activity of those communities are, what they are actually doing. So who's there and what are they doing uh, in the presence of these aquaculture systems. And so with that, I will hand it back over to Tana Marie and we'll learn a little bit more about how we actually grow the oysters this way. Tana Marie, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for alerting me to that. And Dan, thank you so much for giving that overview um, that laid out sort of the big problem, why we're addressing it, and the focus on where the nitrogen um, cycle areas come in and the work of the microbial communities. So now we're going to, um, with that overlay, of sort of the big project context in mind. Um, when you signed up for this webinar, in our title, you saw it said oysters, gear, and nitrogen, and keep it from be going stinky. You will understand the stinky part at the end. Right now, we're going to be talking about the farming components of the study, how that was set up, um, why we chose the systems we did, and also just the whole process of growing these animals, what was learned, all of those, the sort of pros and cons, and, 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 and different um, takeaways that could be helpful for people sort of doing that in different areas. So I'm going to invite our sort of project 
project collaborator and representative of a practitioner and end user, um, Chuck, to also um, walk us through this. On the line, we also have Christina Lovely from, from the department in Falmouth as well, who I'm sure they'll tag team later on on questions. So Chuck, I hand over to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let me just make sure I'm good to advance here. Uh, I'm just going to jump back into this on one moment. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you so much for your for your time uh, this morning. My name is Chuck Martins. I'm the Shellfish Constable and uh, Deputy Director of, of Marine and Environment uh, with the Town of Falmouth. Um, before I get started this morning, I would uh, first like to thank a number of different groups that uh, were uh, community groups that were involved in, in helping set up the farm and do a lot of the measurements of the animals um, and ultimately help bring these animals to harvest later on. And those include the Falmouth Rod and Gun Club, the Falmouth Volunteer Corps, uh, the Barnesville County Sheriff's uh, Office and Upper Cape Tech students uh, and staff as well. Uh, and there are another a number of other volunteers who were also on this project. Um, what I'm going to be covering today is uh, the gear types that we used and uh, the different ways that they're set out and a little bit of the information that we derived uh, from our uh, from our growing seasons. So when you're looking at uh, what you're going to use for gear, there's a number of different considerations uh, that you need to look at. Um, the three main ones that we find are site access, water depth, and the substrate sediment type. There's also other issues such as navigation, resource issues which are involved in permitting. But as far as the actual gear selection, these, are, these three primary pieces are important when you're looking at types of gear for, for selection. Um, when we look at our gear, there are some commonalities that we have among all the different systems. And these commonalities uh, are that we use a, a bag sleeve system. And in some of these systems, they're contained in a larger, um, a larger setup or a, or a condo, if you would, which we'll, we'll go into those photos in a few minutes. Uh, some of the other ones are individually grown in bags, but we use bags for all these systems. Um, the oysters that we grow, the systems that we use, we can use them both on first year animals and second year animals after overwintering. So the gear type doesn't change. The only thing that changes are the size of the holes in the bags so that the animals can feed throughout the growing seasons. Uh, generally, we will start between a four and a six millimeter bag and we'll bump that up to about a 13 millimeter bag later on. Um, and again, they can be used as a, as a primary grow out area or a primary grow out uh, tool, or they can also be used uh, as a secondary tool. Um, switching slides here. Just having some issues advancing, I apologize. So, when we're looking at the differences, and we'll go through uh, first the aerials here. If everyone can see, these are our bottom cages. These sit on the bottom and they contain six individual bags in each cage. And what you're looking at here, it's this overview photo, is that uh, on this side we have our second year animals, and this side is our first year animals on the bottom cages. These right here are floating bag systems. And then in this one, we have our second year animals and this is our first year animals. And then uh, in further along here, we have our condos, which are, uh, we call our midwater systems. And again, those are, there's a, a grouping there of 90 bags uh, or 15 condos, which uh, include the first year animals and the second year animals. Some of the differences in these systems uh, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis include the vulnerability uh, to prevailing winds and then also storms as well. Um, if you think about it, if uh, the tides are high and you have a wind event um, and a lot of that action or velocities on the surface, 
um, the bottom cages generally do a little bit better. They're not as beat up. Now the, the systems that are the top bags, they will ride in the waves. We've had those systems handle up to 70 mile an hour winds. Um, however, that being said, they are, uh, they are um, a little more or a lot more vulnerable. Kind of in the middle, we have our midwater cages, which are all the way to the right again. And those are partially in the water, but they've got a little bit more holding power just because they're heavier setups. Um, a couple of the other differences include the costs. Uh, the costs for the, for the bag systems vary. And um, there is some variability in the oyster growth, including the shell height and also the shell weight as well, which we'll get to in a little bit here. So let's go through the systems. The first system we, we have is the bag system. The way this works is on the top, there's a slider, uh, which contains the oysters. Some folks put a zip tie in here. We, we don't wanna waste the plastic, uh, so we don't bother with zip ties. Um, on one end, there's a loop and you can't really see it on this photo, but you might see it in one of the future ones. There's a clip on this end. Um, these bags are set up in an array and there's a main line that runs down either side of the bag system. The installation uh, or the maximum water depth that we need for floating bag systems is really not that big of an issue. We can put these in in pretty deep uh, areas of water and we can also put them in in relatively shallow areas. Um, the substrate that we're using isn't a big factor in the site selection. However, it is a factor when you're when you're in the area and you're tending the animals. If you want to walk on the, on the bottom, you would need to obviously have a substrate which is a little bit more solid. If you're working out of a boat, um, it really wouldn't matter. Um, the biggest piece to the floating bag systems is that you wanna position these systems so that the opening in the bag is oriented towards your prevailing wind. And the reason is, is because the wind is gonna push the oysters uh, on the surface to the back of the bag. And um, if they're set up, and we've, we learned this over time, if they're set up the other way, there is force put on the slide or the opening and you can lose oysters. So we've learned that over time. So this is a really um, kind of general photo or diagram. And we'll go through it right here. This represents a four inch or five inch poly ball that we use uh, on four corners and then this right here represents a, uh, a, sl a sleeve or a, depending on how we're doing the system setup, it's either a sleeve or a, or a two and a half inch post uh, that's sunk into the ground. Running between these two systems is our main line. And then the bags, as I said, hook from one end to the other uh, on the main line. This whole system floats up and down. This sleeve right here is actually a piece of PVC which sits on a pipe so the whole system rises and falls with the tide. We'll get into a little bit more about that system and, and some photos in a little bit here which will help describe the system a little bit better. As far as maintenance, depending on the water depth, um, it might be more helpful to maintain uh, this at a higher tide or a lower tide if you're pushing the, the, the depth that you're already working in, you'll obviously want a lower tide. Uh, if you are concerned about the functionality of people out tending these systems, sometimes a higher tide is better, or you can also manipulate who tends what. Taller people might wanna be a little bit further out in the water so they're not leaning over and kind of doing damage to their body. One of the things that we really take into consideration is, you know, when, we're, when we have thousands and thousands of bags that we work with is, is how do we present our bodies to the farm each day so that we don't sustain injuries to ourselves? Um, these bags are flipped uh, usually between about, about every other week or two to three times a month. If they're growing rapidly, we'll generally uh, flip them a little bit more. Um, the maintenance uh, and as far, far as a labor perspective uh, is the least on these systems and they are the least um, cumbersome to work with weight wise. So this is a really good photo. This is a setup from Bourne's Pond, uh, which is very similar to the system that we use, but it was a good up close shot. And if you look, these are our PVC slides. Uh, these are our posts. Our footprint of what is touching the bottom 
for an entire array is, uh, is uh, you're only looking at, um, at uh, approximately a square foot for this whole first bag set up here. And again, we've got the floats on the outside, which slide up and down on the poles. And these are oriented uh, in such a way. Th this actual system was so far north that we didn't really need to worry about the velocity um, affecting the oysters just because it was so far in the system that it wasn't affected by the wind. Um, this system is uh, the least expensive to set up uh, in comparison to other growing methods. However, there is a level of labor which is required to assemble these bags. And the bags going back again have floats on either side. There is a top and then loops and clips. So unlike the other systems, you need to assemble these bags initially. So there's an upfront cost. They're not gear ready. So you can't purchase them from a gear provider and then just go in the water and throw them in. There is an upfront cost to, to getting them uh, to the point that they can be farmed. Um, generally, these bags last, uh, I have some bags in our system that have lasted 10 years. Uh, we generally cycle them through and then sometimes they need to be rebuilt, uh, but they generally last for at least 10 years. So the main takeaway that I'll cover with the floating bag systems is that they yielded the largest and fastest second, gro second year growing oysters, and they were in the middle uh, in comparison to the first year oysters compared to the other systems. As we're gonna see in a little bit, the variation between the growth is somewhat uh, limited. It's not vast. Moving along, this is our second system. This is the midwater condos. The way these condos are set up is they either come in groups of, of six bags or groups of nine bags. These systems we use were nine bag setups. If you look at, you can see the, the scum line, uh, algae lines on the water. Uh, generally these from here up will float and then this sits below the water. These systems work well for if you've got fouling that's taking place in a certain area, you can come along and flip these over and let them bake in the sun for a little bit. Um, the individual bagged compartments are accessed through a door, which we'll see in a, in a photo, uh, in a few slides, and the the bags that we that we use just have the bags in the top. There's no um, no need for additional kind of assembly after you receive these systems. There's no additional fabrication. So the installation is not a factor on the site selection, uh, with the exception of you don't want them sitting on the bottom. Um, so, you know, you do need to have a little consideration, but not, it's not a, not a major issue. Um, again, the bottom stage substrate is not a primary factor in site selection. Um, it would only be a factor for some anchoring systems. We use the pole system on this one as well. If you were using a helix system and you were in an area where there was a significant amount of cobble, um, or you were uh, trying to sink a pole into a very uh, soft bottom, there could be some issues. Um, this, is, this system is vulnerable to high winds um, and it does have that floating main line where everything goes up and down with it. From a maintenance perspective, the condos need to be uh, flipped and, or you can actually open them from the water, but generally flipping them is the easiest way to address them. And they need to be scrubbed uh, usually every two weeks to, to allow the, um, the fouling to not uh, adhere to the bag system. Um, the height on this, there are ways that this can be done, the depth, this can be done out of a boat, or it can also be done uh, by walking on the bottom. So there are multiple options. Uh, this can be very labor intensive and time consuming. Um, so again, getting back to kind of how we're treating our bodies, um, this is probably, you know, one of, if not the most um, labor intensive piece using this gear. Again, looking at this photo, you can see the doors, which are on this side, which are, there's bungee cord here, the whole door flips up, these bags slide right out. You can give them a shake, flip them over. Um, what's good is when you do tend these systems, 
there is a level of kind of tumbling that takes place or re-edging of the shell. A little bit of that shell will break off. So we did notice that we had tremendous shells um, from our animals that grew both in this system and also in our uh, surface bag system. Um, looking as far as cost for a, for a 90 bag array with 15 cages, you're looking at just over 3,500. Um, it's it's uh, the most expensive setup. However, it has the least labor necessary to deploy. And um, you know, the main takeaway from this system, the midwater systems yield the largest, fastest gro growing first year oysters and the intermediary size second year oysters in comparison to other systems. So for just looking at seed that we're putting in the water, they, they would be the kind of the choice if you were just looking at um, putting on growth. This is our third system. This is the bottom condos, pretty self-explanatory. Um, if, if you look here, we have the three bottom feet. They sit right on the bottom. The way we tend these is we actually rock these systems uh, 90 degrees so we can remove the bags and then we'll rock them back down on the ground when we're done. They're a little bit easier to work with just because generally they're in a little bit shallower water. Um, one of the interesting, you know, kind of pieces to when you're selecting uh, gear is that, you know, depending on your community, some communities I know just um, the, the aesthetics kind of rule the, rule the roost. In other communities, um, it might be navigation that rules the roost. In other communities, it might be um, say the Conservation Commission is very concerned with storm damage. So that can be a consideration. So each one of these systems has their own benefits to whatever your community might or might not be interested in. Um, that being said, the growth differences are not vast enough that they necessarily would outweigh any of those particular considerations if you had a hurdle in, in permitting. Um, the, uh, again, these systems hold six bags. You can do up to nine. Uh, generally, I don't like to have these out of the water on a low tide. However, there are many growers that do, particularly uh, in areas of the Cape where we have significant tidal uh, uh, variations. Don't forget in Falmouth, we're only working with about 20 to 24 inches of tide where we did this project. So um, our tidal range is, is very low. Um, as far as the bottom condos, they just sit on the bottom. There's really no attaching lines. Um, you do need a firm substrate. Uh, what we do also mention in this area is that um, you know these other systems stand up there. You know you can see them when you're when you're motoring by on a boat. The bottom cages you can't see particularly in a higher tide if you're not looking for them. So they can pose a a danger or a hazard. Uh, these systems are generally marked anyways. Uh, you're going to mark them with normally yellow balls or orange balls, uh, depending. So there are navigational markings for these. However, um, there are some people that aren't familiar with what they are. So the navigation can be an issue. So the maintenance on these, again, we remove the bags from the condos. We flip them, remove any of the debris, and, um, and go ahead and return them. And these are usually done every other week. The cost on these is again, about $2,500, a little bit more. It's the intermediary uh, cost option. However, it's on the higher end of the three options. The main takeaway on the bottom cages is that they yield oysters of smaller or at best similar shell height in mass in comparison to other systems. So what we're going to get into next is, is a little bit about the data. And this is just kind of a quick overview or a quick snapshot of some of the data. So what this slide represents is the first year oyster shell growth. So the total uh, length of the shell in the first year animals. And as you can see, the, the, uh, there's really not much difference. It's, it's roughly you know, two millimeters between the systems. So again, as I said, there's not a big variation uh, in which systems grow oysters faster uh, from what we saw over the two years of growing uh, first year oysters. 
So this is the second year animals. There's a little bit more variation. Um, you're looking at roughly 16 millimeters. Um, there is obviously bag variations as well within the bag. Uh, so um, there is, you know, there is ranges inside the bag. However, um, again, whether there is a level of variation of uh, you know, 16 or so millimeters, that's not necessarily a bad thing, particularly if you have animals going to market and you don't want them all going to market at once. So there's good variability in your bags. This is the oyster weights. And um, this is the first year animals. And there was some variation in the, in the weights, um, which, which was not significant. Um, however, there was the midwaters seemed to take on more weight. Um, the next slide right here are the second year animals. And I kind of want to highlight this a little bit because if you look at the bottom, uh, we were only looking at, you know, 35 grams on the bottom setups. Although the, the midwaters, we were up at 58 grams. One of the things that I think is going to be interesting here, and we can look at this a little bit further. And this is from a marketing perspective, in my opinion, for people who are selling oysters is, is where were they picking up this weight? Um, we didn't do a lot of work on separating out uh, meat weight or wet weight of the meat or the shell weight. So there's kind of two stories here going on. Uh, we don't know which one it is in this situation. The first story is, is that maybe you have a little bit more meat weight going in these midwaters or a decent amount more meat weight going into these midwaters. And what that means is that your oyster likely would be a more robust oyster when it ended up on your plate. The second is that possibly the midwaters might be taking on that weight in shell weight, which ultimately would mean that you would have a, you know, a more a shell that was um, a little bit more uh, viable for opening. It might be a little bit more difficult to open. However, you wouldn't have shell breakage, or it could be a combination of all three. Uh, but there is a uh, there is a kind of a neat story there that we haven't really gotten to the bottom of yet. Um, and uh, but it, it does it could very well play into the uh, over, you know, kind of the overall sale of oysters later on down the road and how they present on the plate. So at this point, I will take uh, any questions that anyone might have. Thank you, Chuck. Um, thank you for walking us through that so well and laying out the systems. We do have two questions in the chat. And so we're gonna go ahead and take that. Lori, I'm gonna take the question um, from uh, Jeff. Um, and then perhaps you can take the next one in line. Sounds good. Okay. And this one might require others in addition on the team too. The, um, Chuck, the question is the placement of the three different types of growing cages was not interspersed. And so results could be biased by systematic environmental differences across the grid. I'm also curious whether dissolved oxygen was depleted below the cages, especially to the extent as to be detrimental to the benzos. Any comments, Chuck? Um, I think probably best answered by uh, Dan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll jump in. Uh, we measured dissolved oxygen every time we went out. We went out, we went out every two weeks. Uh, there isn't a depletion of oxygen under any of the cages. Um, we also, the first year measured dissolved oxygen in the sediments underneath the cages. And we don't see a rapid decline in there either. Um, what was the other part of the question? The placement of the three different types of cages was not interspersed and so results could be biased. Uh, I'm gonna assume by interspersed, you're meaning mixed so that we had one plot with mixed with all three cage types. Mm -hmm. We didn't want that because we wanted to see what the effect of each cage type was. So we need separate plots of each of them. Each of these uh, plots were compared to a control site that was uh, just to the east, east of, uh, of our experimental site. So when you see our data, I'll, I'll walk through it a little again, um, but you'll see that we're comparing to what the sediments do naturally. And we're looking for differences to that control site. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chuck. Let's go to the next question, Lori. Sure, we have a question from Dale. Did you determine whether the oyster sizes are actually different given the variability? 
I'm going to have Christina take that one if I could. Sure. Um, when we're taking our, when we're sampling and collecting this data, we're taking um, measurements not just from one bag. We're taking about four or five different bags in each system every different week. And every single time we sampled, we were taking from a different bag. They're all randomly selected. So this, these uh, conclusions that we're coming to are all in aggregate. So this is not just one point that one point in our data set. It's very much an average. So we're very confident in um, these results that these oysters are, you know, between these systems where there are differences, there, there are definitely differences. Some differences are as much smaller than others as you'll see in the weight um, or the shell, the shell height. But um, when you see two, to millime two millimeter differences, that is probably not a big variation. But when you see the weight difference of about 20 grams, that, that is definitely um, a noticeable difference. That's an actual difference. Um, a very, you know, it's not just individual bags differences. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Just like to add one more thing, if I could, uh, we can post up um, a lot more of our uh, kind of data um, online, uh, which covers a lot of the various points um, along the measurements and everything else. So um, we can certainly make any of that av available to anyone um, for farming purposes or other. Thanks, Chuck. And that's a point I'll circle back to at the end, too, just about what we're making available for others, um, you know, to inform your work at the end here. We'll, we'll, we'll tag that again. Um, I think we have time for two more. Um, Lori, I'll take the one from Susanna, and then you can take the one from Amber. Um, was the seed all from the same hatchery or spawn? That's a great question. Yes, this seed was. Um, we have done work with varied seed from other areas and have that information as well on a totally different project, but this was all from the same seed provider. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, and last question from Amber. Did you see significant differences in mortality between gear types? We did not. Nope, and we have um, mortality numbers as well, which we'd be happy to post up uh, on that end. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to cheat and take one more. Um, just, I, I, you know, we'll come back. We have another Q and A um, component later on, so we'll take ones that we may not get to. Um, I'm just going to squeeze in one from Mark here, and we'll try to condense the answer for this. Mark says, "You have done a nice job explaining the rationale for building your own farm. Was there consideration to work with industry partners to understand farm scale effects, and this would also engage growers in the process?" Absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I mean, scaling things up, there's a few things that we have as a community that other farms do not have. And, and one of which is a, is a labor force, a volunteer labor force, which, um, which uh, you know, when you start to talk about scale up is a big consideration. Um, this whole project, the roots of this project were rooted in um, selecting gear that was options that were provided to us by the industry itself, by the providers of gear to the industry. So there was that initial connection. Um, where we're at right now is, uh, is, and we've always kind of been doing this, is providing a medium of information of the research that we've done to growers so that they can make their own decisions moving forward. Um, however, we, we do that with the full knowledge of knowing that we have opportunities as a community which differ from the private industry. Um, so I think our kind of our platform has always been at the department and, and in this project and everything else. We hope to provide tools for growers to better inform themselves uh, for investment purposes later on down the road. Thank you, Chuck and Christina and Dan. And thank you, audience, for your great questions so far. I see that there's some others in the chat box, and we're going to attempt to get to those later. But I do want to just now go and segue to the next section of um, the project and our next series of um, presenters. And again, to warm up our brains, we just heard about farming. We're now going to switch gears, um, not completely, but somewhat, to hear um, more about the microorganisms, more about the nitrogen 
um, cycling and what's happening in the sediments and these interesting components to tie this back to that nitrogen remediation um, sort of case study that we presented at the beginning. So to help us, um, uh, just to get our minds in that in that frame, I am going to pull up two more questions. I encourage you to to, to t log in your answers quickly so that we can get everybody's responses. So I just allow me a second to bring up um, our next poll here. And this is kind of like one of those questions that you got the answer to in class, um, if you were paying attention to Dan's overview before. Do the microorganisms that occur naturally in marine sediments affect the forms and levels of nitrogen in these sediments? This is a very important takeaway. Answers are still coming in, but I'm we have a good crop of answers in already. So I'm going to just go ahead and close the poll just to keep us on time here. Um, so it looks like um, over 90% of the audience believes the answer is yes. We do have some not sure and we do have one no. Um, and so um, great, you guys were paying attention. Either you learned something or you knew it before. So that is um, the majority if the responses are correct. Um, and for the group that's not sure, um, thank you for, for logging that in. And we hope that as we go through the next series of, of presenters, you will sort of understand this piece even better. I'm going to end this poll and I'm going to bring up the second one. Uh, I didn't share the results. That's what it looked like. I could see the results on my end. That was the result. Okay, let me go to the second and last poll question that we have for you for this piece. So this question says, do the microorganisms that remove nitrogen from the sediments require oxygen? And again, this is an important sort of frame for understanding what we're gonna be talking about. Just a couple more seconds. Get your answers in. Nobody will even know if you got it wrong. It's just all for learning. So I'm going to end the poll now, and then we're going to see some very interesting results. At least I think they're interesting. Um, look at that. It's a pretty even spread in terms of people's answer to that question. And um, like I said, this is an important sort of frame for the next series of um, presentations and how we're going to sort of connect the dots between the stories for this project. And I'm going to leave it as a cliffhanger. Dan, I don't know if you want to take it, if you want to um, answer it now or if you want to let the answer emerge as the presentations go forward. What would you prefer? I can answer it now. Uh, so if you were one of my students, you'd probably complain that it was a trick question. Uh, if you remember back to my arrow diagram, we need both oxic and anoxic. We need environments that have oxygen and environments that don't have oxygen to get our nitrogen from what we excrete all the way back to the atmosphere. So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so it's complicated, just like the environment we're trying to study and understand. So I'm going to stop sharing these results and then I'm going to hand over um, to our science team for this project. And they're going to tag team on a presentation, all three of them, starting with um, Dan, then we're going to go to Ginny, and then we're going to go to Vivian, um, actually out of order, Dan, Vivian, and then Ginny. And so um, I'm going to invite you, Dan, to take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, so 
we left, when I last left you, I left you with some big questions. And then we heard from Chuck. There we go. And uh, were there differences between using different gear types? There are some differences. There's some things to be considered when you're doing this. I wanna thank Chuck for all his input and his team at the town of Falmouth, uh, who did most of, who did all of our maintenance and installation uh, work. What we want to transition to is this is an idea we were trying to understand what happens in the sediments. Can the sediments be um, used to remove nitrogen in this process? We're gonna tell this story in three different ways. So we're gonna answer these last three questions. Do we see a change in nitrogen release? Do we see a change in the microbial communities? Do we see a change in the activities of those communities? So it's really a story in three parts. I'm gonna talk about nitrogen release or I'll, I tend to call it flux. A flux is simply a movement of mass across a plane. Um, and so we can measure the mass of nitrogen leaving the sediment. So that's what a flux is. And so if you look at this core that I have on the right, this interface right here, nitrogen gas leaving here up to here is a flux measurement. So if I use that term flux is because I'm slipping into my jargon and that's what I mean. We're then gonna hear from Dr. Vivian Mara. She really took the lead on our uh, molecular analysis of the system. And she's gonna tell you about what the community looked like and what other evidences we have that this process is occurring or how it's occurring. And then finally, we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Jenny Edgecombe and she's gonna summarize what we have told you and then extend it to how we can use this uh, and other systems and going on into the future. So we saw our system as Chuck presented with from the aerial view. This is just a sort of slightly higher view of our system. We have our three systems growing here, our bottom cages, our floating bags, our oyster grows, and we have this control sediment site over here. We were also fortunate enough to be able to install a teaching site over here closer to the reserve. So this was used by Webner's education um, department, education coordinator, to reach out to teachers and children and neighbors uh, so that people could get an idea and actually touch and feel the oysters, which is uh, an important way to get people accustomed to what that their actions can have an impact on the coastal waters. So every two weeks we went out sampling uh, from April, May until September, October timeframe. So we're going through the whole growing season of the oysters. At the end of October, all the oysters are removed from uh, the water. They are either put into related to sand flats or they might be stored overwintered uh, by the town. All the gear comes out of the water and we just go back to a, a common uh, body of water. What you're looking at here are two of, uh, two of our students going out and starting the sampling regime. The first thing we do when we arrive on site is we profile the water column for temperature, salinity, and oxygen. We wanna know if the oyster aquacultures are changing the local water underneath them. And so we can do those measurements to look at that. We then send them back out into the water and we start collecting sediment cores. So inside that cooler that Megan is holding is a bunch of sediment cores like I showed you in the previous slide. And we're gonna do a number of things with those sediment cores. The first thing we do is we bring them back to the beach. Science is a happy process. Once on the beach, we can process these cores in a number of ways. We can look at oxygen concentrations going down core. We can look at, um, we can collect samples for DNA and RNA extraction, so the information and, and community structures that are there. And we can do incubations to look at how much nitrogen is removed uh, from these sediments. So we're doing all these things in real time. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, on site. We're also collecting samples to measure the nutrients in the pore waters. And that's what I wanna talk about next. So one of the questions that we had driving this was if these oysters are shuttling nitrogen and carbon down to the sediments in the form of feces or pseudofeces, 
is that changing drastically the chemistry of the sediment. This is nitrate, uh, nitrate data from the pore water. So again, pore waters are those waters that are between the sediment grains and the sediment. So we're down in the sediment, not in the water column. And what you're looking at here, I realize it's small. And uh, what I want you to take away is that there's not a lot of nitrate in the sediments. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter whether you're at the control site or one of the aquaculture sites. For all of these colored slides that we're gonna put up, we have a legend up in the top corner. The blue bars are controls, the orange bars are oyster growth, the gray bars are floating bags, and the yellow bars are the bottom cages. And so we see some excursions, but when we have excursions, for the most part, all the systems have the excursion, not just one. So it's something bigger than what the aquaculture is doing. So we don't see a significant difference in uh, nitrate between the control and the treatment sites and the aquaculture sites. Well, what about ammonia? Ammonia is a slightly different story, especially in the first year. In the first year, we start out with much higher ammonium than nitrate. That tells us something about what's going on in the environment. You remember ammonium was where we entered that nitrogen cycle. We need oxygen to move from ammonium to nitrate and then ultimately back to uh, dinitrogen in an anaerobic setting. Well, we see a buildup of ammonia in a lot of these systems. And principally in this oyster growth system in 2018, we see ammonia buildup. And so we start to have to think about how do we get that ammonia buildup? There's two ways to get there. It's either organic raining in and not being um, mobilized back to nitrate, or Remember that third process I talked about, DNRA? We might have that process becoming active and pushing, um, pushing nitrogen back to the ammonium form. Now, we didn't see that fact repeated in the 2019 data. So we don't know if this is just an excursion in these uh, float, sorry, the floating bags, um, my color's off, the floating bag system. Uh, we didn't see it as much in the 2019 data. So that's something that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Is it just the fact that we're putting more carbon and nitrogen into the sediments? What we're looking at here is the carbon content of the sediments. And so as we go up on the y-axis, we're looking at increase in carbon content and uh, increase in months as we go along the, the x-axis. The bottom two lines are the control site. So we have no oysters there. And we see that uh, the carbon content of that control site is pretty much steady uh, both years throughout. In the oyster grow and the floating bag systems, that's that middle grouping of bars here, we see an elevated uh, input of carbon uh, as we go throughout the summer in both years. And we see even, even more dramatic increase in carbon content in the bottom cages, about 14% more carbon uh, than in the control site. And so we do see an effective movement of material from the water column down to the sediment column. That's what we're hoping our oysters would do. Does this change result in more release of nitrogen from the sediment? That's the next question we had. So we collect cores and we process those cores for the microbiology end and for the pore water uh, chemistry. And then we go back out and we collect another set of cores. Those cores are capped, they're sealed. Through that cap is an oxygen sensor. So I can measure oxygen in real time. And we let these cores incubate at in situ temperatures uh, for a couple of hours. We're monitoring oxygen all the time. What that setup looks like is right here on the right. So this is our meter connected to our computer. And down in this cooler, we have, there should be, uh, I think six cores in that cooler uh, with oxygen probes, that's all these wires going down. And so if we measure oxygen in temperature, we can let these cores incubate, run their natural processes until we get enough oxygen consumption that we think we have a signal. We tend to monitor oxygen down to about 25%. And at 25% uh, remaining, we will stop the incubations because we don't want to drive these cores anoxic 
and maybe artificially stimulate um, nitrogen removal. At the end of that incubation, we take a sample and we can measure the production of N2 in that sample using something called a membrane in that mass spectrometer. That's what's pictured here, this thing. What this does is it actually measures atom by atom the amount of nitrogen produced in each core. We can compare these to our control set, uh, sediments, and then we can calculate how much nitrogen is released per unit surface area of that core. Again, we're, we're calling it nitrogen release today. I usually call it a flux. It's the movement of nitrogen from the sediments into the water column through the surface area of that core. That data looks something like this. 2018 on the left, 2019 on the right. And what you can see in the blue columns is the control uh, site on both years. And again, this nitrogen release is a natural process. This is a process these organisms will do anyway. Once you run out of oxygen in the sediments, the next best way to burn your carbon is to burn it with nitrate. So that's what these organisms are doing. And we can see that as the summer uh, increases, or as, it, as we progress through the seasons, we see an increase in nitrogen release from these control cores. Okay, what's driving that? Most likely temperatures. As we tend to warm up the waters, biological processes get faster. These are all biologically driven processes. So as temperature increases, these rates also increase. And that's probably what we're seeing uh, in the control setting. And so I can do some math. I can say, well, from end of August through uh, September or August and, and September, I can calculate how much nitrogen is coming out uh, of these, this control site per day. And I can calculate that per day, it's only about uh, two to five grams uh, from the site per day. But over the two month period, that's about a tenth to a third of a kilogram of nitrogen coming from the control settings. These are the sediments without any oyster impact on them. Well, what if I do the same thing for the oyster settings? So if I look back at these oyster controls, uh, these, these oyster treatments, if I compare these to the controls, we can see this dramatic increase in nitrogen release over the course, especially towards the end of the summer. And what's important is that it's elevated over what the control sediments at the same time are doing. Okay? I can do the same mathematical treatment and I can say, well, if I draw a bar, most of them reach within this blue bar and I can calculate that between August and September, each of those sites removes 14 to 17 grams of nitrogen per site per day. And that calculates out to over those two months, almost a kilogram of nitrogen removal just from the sediments. So this is, you get nitrogen removal from harvesting the animals, but you also get this natural removal from the sediments. So we're seeing a stimulation of nitrogen removal from the sediments. Now you may say, <clears throat> excuse me, you may say a kilogram doesn't sound like a lot, but we have to consider the size of these farms. These farms are only about 250 square meters or a little bit under 250 square meters. Many of the commercial farms might be quite a bit larger. And so this sort of treatment ought to scale with size uh, of, the, of the farm. And so if we, if we scale way up, uh, we, can, we can do this. A similar calculation for the amount of nitrogen that, could take, that, would, be, that would have been taken out from the animals themselves, simply harvesting the animals, puts that nitrogen at 12 kilograms. So we're looking at just under 10% of our nitrogen is coming out from the sediments uh, over just two months versus the uh, whole growth cycle of the oysters. It's something that we think uh, should be significant. So we can see that we have the process happening. We can measure the end products. We can measure the release of the nitrogen from the sediments. The next question that we had was, how is that happening? The chemistry just tells us what's happening and how fast it's happening. It doesn't tell us how it's happening. We don't want to push these systems in a way that dramatically alters the uh, microbial communities in these sediments and does something that it doesn't normally do. So we're gonna look at that next. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Vivian Mara.
hello. Just give me one second so I can uh, share my screen with you. All right. All right. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I guess you can see my screen right now, right? Yes, we can. Okay. So, continuing after uh, Professor Rogers' uh, information, I would just I would like to tell you now uh, some things that uh, we try to answer concerning the, the concerning the nitrogen release in the in the using different uh, oyster treatment years. So the first question that we had to answer was the following if it works of course all right so the first question that we had to to answer was we, we had to we had to be able to identify which bacteria groups which bacteria let's say taxa are living in the sediments underneath the different treatments the different years and at the same time we had to be able to identify if these were different from the control so in order to do that, we had uh, basically to identify the genetic fingerprint of this uh, sediment. So what we were doing is during 2018, 2019, we were collecting the sediment underneath the gear and also at the control site, and we were collecting the DNA, the DNA pulled from the sediments. This process was for us to be able to identify, to describe the bacterial community underneath the gear and also at the control site, which would give us an idea who is present at the time, at the time of every different sampling that we were doing between April and October. So this type of uh, analysis, it's basically DNA sequencing analysis. So when it comes to, um, to cost, it's not a very, let's say, complicated analysis. And also it has a moderate exp uh, expense. We will, uh, we will discuss about that later during the presentation. So after identifying who is present in the sediment, the next question that we had to answer was what these bacteria are doing in terms of what activities are present, metabolic activities are present in the sediment and in the control sites. This would give us an idea of uh, generally what processes are happening in the sediments at the time of the sampling. In order to be able to do that, we were actually collected, again, sediments. And in this case, what we extracted was the RNA that it was present in the sediment. So this could give us a proxy of the microbial community, the microbial activity. And of course, it would give us the general idea of what type of processes are happening in the sediment. Of course, this uh, transcriptome analysis that has to do with uh, the activity of the bacterial communities, it's usually a very complicated and challenging, let's say, uh, analysis, and also it's extremely expensive. However, as Professor Rogers said, the question was not to, for us to identify what is happening in the sediment like as a total metabolic activity, rather to be able to be more specific and answer questions that they were related with nitrogen cycling and especially denitrification, anamox and DNRA. So what we did here is we applied a more specific, a more specific technique, molecular technique that it is called RTQPCR. I'm sure that all of you, you know about this technique because it's the same technique that we use for the COVID-19 test, right? So this technique, what it does, it's actually targets specific genes of interest. So uses the RNA pool that we extracted on the previous step and quantifies genes of interest, only those that people are interested to study. So this uh, type of method is, uh, is quick, is inexpensive. And uh, of course, if you have a protocol that works, you don't have any problem, you can apply it. So answering the first question, trying to find genetic signature, trying to identify bacterial groups underneath the, uh, the oyster treatments and at the control site. So as you can see here, C is for the control floating bag, bag bottom cages and oyster grow treatments. As you can see on the Y axis, we have all the phyla, meaning that we provide here on this slide, the higher taxonomic level. We don't go in, we don't analyze the specific families or the specific genuses. We just want to show what basic groups of uh, bacteria were present in the in the control, including also the um, the treatments during throughout all the sampling period. Of course, as you can see, we had the same phyla present, which makes sense because don't forget that we were sampling from the same uh, let's say uh, setup, the same um, uh, the same bay water water. Uh, Wakoi Bay, 
And also we could see that they had a similar pattern across the growing season. So the, as I said though, however, do remember that this, we are talking about the higher taxonomic level right now, and we don't, uh, we don't focus further on the families or on the, or on the specific genuses. And also what it was interesting for us, it was that almost 60% of the bacteria group, the bacteria groups that we identified at Wakoi Bay in general, were, were still under investigation in terms of we are we don't uh, we're not we don't know a hundred percent what they are doing in terms of metabolic activities and also who they are they are uncultured bacteria which makes it fascinating so asking the question now how nitrogen cycling works under the different gears compared to the control sites and of course the first question was okay denitrification because it is the, be the, be the it is what we need to answer primarily nitrogen release so here in these plots what we are what we are actually see is different marker genes that we try we isolated using the rtq pcr method different denitrification genes that which are marker genes here on the y-axis at different treatments floating back bottom cages oyster grow and on the x-axis, we see here again the sampling dates. What I, want to sh what I want to point out here is that regardless of the shape, regardless of the size or the color of the, of the bubbles that you see here, what we did observe is that all the denitrification genes that they were examined, both in 2018 and 2019, were different, were highly expressed, were more expressed compared to the control, which means that, of course, denitrification as a process it's a micro, it's a it's a process that it is uh, happened by, by microbes, but under the treatments was enhanced, which was very important. And in some cases, some of these some of these genes, especially after the end of July, they were increased almost like a million times more in terms of expression, which means active denitrification present underneath the gears, the different treatments. The other question that we had was besides nitrification, which is the principal, uh, the principal process of uh, nitrogen removal from the sediments, can another process also release nitrogen from the sediments and be active under the different gears? And this was anamox. So the difference between anamox and denitrification, besides the biochemistry part, is that anamox can be performed only by one bacterial group compared to denitrification, that there are too many different bacterial groups that they can actually do it. So this is the reason why up to now the literature points out that Anamox, it's a more limited process in different bivalve, bivalve uh, let's say aquaculture sites, just because it happens on a smaller scale. In, in our case though, what we did is we also monitor the anaerobic, anaerobic oxidation of ammonium under the treated, different treatments and under the control side. And as you can see here with blue color is again the control. As you can see, both in 2018 and 2000, uh, 2018 and 2019, the control, the, the expression of uh, the gene marker that uh, give us the idea if Anamox is present or not, you know, as a process occurs naturally at Wakoi Bay. But was, what was interesting is that in some cases like the bottom cages, the expression of, uh, of uh, the marker gene of uh, anaerobic oxidation of ammonium was increasing, especially again after July, from July and uh, onward. So this was on bottom cages. And this happened in both years. At the same time, when we, when we tried to do a similar comparison for the floating bags, we ended up finding that the anaerobic oxidation of ammonium between the control and the floating bags was, was at similar level between the control and the FB treatment. And then what was interesting for us was that when comparing the control to the oyster grow gear, the expression of this gene was decreased. So Dr. Edgecup will explain that uh, later why this happened, but I just want to point out and don't forget that both in the denitrification and in the anamox processes, the results that we found were 
the same, I mean, not the same, they were like repeated between the two years, which is an important factor when we are talking about an environmental scale experiments and not laboratory scale experiments, which makes the difference. Of course, the last question that we had regarding nitrogen was, okay, we talked about release. What about retention? What about if uh, by having the oyster treatment, we also, let's say, enhance processes of retaining nitrogen? So what we did here is actually we targeted one specific gene, a marker gene called NRFA, that it is a marker gene of uh, dissimilatory um, reduction of uh, nitrate to ammonium. So again, here, what we did find is that DNRA as a process controls naturally in the Wakoi base. So that's why you could see here the controls with blue color. This is the expression level of this gene. And as you can see over the season, the expression of DNRA increases in the control both years, which is something that happens naturally on the system. However, what we did observe is that under the bottom cages, this process was enhanced by day zero that we counted. And as the growing season was going along, you could see that this increase was higher and higher. This happened in both years. When it came to floating bugs, we did find that indeed under floating bugs, the communities, the bacterial communities, it was like a competition between denitrification and DNRA. So the floating bugs here had also higher expression of the, of, uh, of the NRFA gene, but in some cases it was, let's say, comparable to the control. What was again in both years, also this happened in both years, so what was amazing and observed for two sequential years was that oyster growth presented the exact opposite result. Started with same expression levels of the NRFA genes, which means same expression level of a process that retain nitrogen in the ecosystem. So oyster growth and control, they started with similar levels. And thus the season continued onward, the oyster grow suppressed, meaning decreased the expression of uh, uh, the NRFA gene, meaning that the process was not so, the process of retaining nitrogen in the ecosystem was not so active as it was with the other two years. And again, Dr. Edgecope is going to give a better summary about why this is happening. So yeah, I think that this is, this is okay. This is me, right? And then now Dr. Edgecop can continue with the rest. Anyways, if you have any questions regarding how these genes work, how these genes work, if about their biochemistry, about their expression, about what affects them, et cetera, et cetera, just ask me, I will be more than happy to reply to you. Thank you, Vivian. All right. Let me see now how I stop sharing. Okay. Ginny, you can go ahead and take control now. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, um, so thank you again for um, allowing us to share our results with you. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have such a big audience with us today. Um, so I'll take, I would like to circle back to the big questions that Dan introduced at the beginning of his, of his um, piece uh, in order to summarize for you the, finding, the findings of our study. And um, the first major question that we asked was whether uh, aquaculture activity uh, changed the release of, let's see, I'm just trying to see whether I can advance my slide, Tana. Oh, there we go. Um, is the first major question that we asked was whether aquaculture activity changed the release of nitrogen that naturally occurs in Wakoit Bay sediments? And the answer was a resounding um, yes. As you can see um, in both years uh, data um, that the, the nitrogen released plotted on the y-axis increases over the season, uh, even at the control site, which is the blue bars, but under all types of um, the farms, the three, the three farm systems, the release of nitrogen was stimulated by the presence of aquaculture. 
um, we one of our original aims was to be able to identify uh, a genetic marker or a kind of a dipstick that would be easily applied by groups interested to know how much nitrogen was being released from their system in order to tell whether they could extend the findings that we have from Lacoit Bay to their site and would tell you um, how much nitrogen was being released at your site based on the expression of a particular gene. Um, it turns out that as science often goes, uh, things don't always turn out exactly like you think they're going to, um, but you learn new things. And uh, we did learn uh, that denitrification um, is a complex process that's often carried out cooperatively by different microbial groups. And as we also uh, know, uh, it's affected by many environmental factors and it competes with other nitrogen cycling processes for uh, the available nitrate. Um, so uh, we learned that uh, none of the aquaculture farm gear types, the bottom cages, the floating bags, the oyster grow midwater systems, none of them changed the composition of the naturally occurring microbial community in Wakoit Bay that you can see in the control, at least at this taxonomic level. Uh, this is uh, an important finding. Um, and, uh, but however, we did see uh, if, in the plot to the right, that it changes the activities of those naturally occurring microorganisms, particularly around the process of denitrification. So in this plot, everywhere where you see a dot is a, a gene that's being expressed under all of our systems at a much higher level than at the control site, particularly uh, starting in August through September where expression of genes uh, of denitrification, which reflect the activity of the microbes is, is uh, greatly enhanced under the uh, aquaculture sites. Um, Anamox, the other nitrogen removal process that we're interested in um, is, is also naturally occurring in Wakoit Bay sediments and um, it, uh, in, it is, uh, but it is not greatly stimulated um, relative to the control, again in blue, um, at any of the aquaculture sites. And oh. important, importantly, it uh, only contributes about 10% uh, of the microbial nitrogen removal um, based on the gene expression data that we have. Um, Anamox is uh, not really stimulated until um, mid-summer, uh, where you see it slightly stimulated um, under the bottom cages, and we think that that is due to the much higher uh, organic uh, matter accumulation there. It's slightly lower um, under the oyster grove system because Anamox um, is a uh, very oxygen sensitive process. And something that we noticed um, when we were observing our site is that the oyster grow systems, which have a higher above water profile with those large floats, uh, they catch the wind and the waves and uh, they create kind of a, a piston pumping motion, uh, which uh, the gear is, is rising and falling in the water and uh, we think that this uh, aerates, slightly aerates the surface sediments under the gear and probably also flushes some of the organic uh, material that tends to accumulate under all, all, aquaculture, all aquaculture sites. So for this reason, we think that this may explain why the Animox was slight, slightly depressed under the oyster grow gear. Um, importantly, um, DNRA, uh, which is also a naturally occurring uh, microbial process that utilizes or consumes nitrate, um, but does not release nitrogen gas and instead stores nitrogen as ammonia in the sediments. Um, this, is, this is also uh, happening. And this is a process that we don't want to encourage if we're interested in nitrogen removal, 
uh, because it's counterproductive to our goal of removing nitrogen from the system as nitrogen gas. Um, what we, what we see is that the DNRA is stimulated um, under uh, the most, under the bottom cages, which you see plotted in yellow uh, here relative to the blue uh, controls. And uh, we think that this is uh, because DNRA is a process that is uh, sensitive to oxygen uh, but uh, more tolerant of sulfide. And so it's stimulated relative to denitrification when conditions become sulfitic. Under the oyster grow system, which has that sort of larger piston uh, pump pumping activity, uh, it seems to be repressed relative to the control. Again, the oyster grow is in the orange bars and the control is in the blue. Um, so starting in midsummer in July, okay, we see that the, the, the DNRA rates become a bit repressed under the oyster grow gear relative to the control, and it becomes enhanced uh, under the bottom gear, um, which is in yellow, uh, because of the accumulation, the much higher observable accumulation of organic matter. Under the bottom cages, we saw the most accumulation of macroalgae and a distinct shadow of organic material that extended toward the, uh, toward the beach. Um, and conditions were more sulfitic underneath the uh, bottom cages. The set when we would handle the gear, the sediments under the bottom cages released um, a distinct sulfide smell. Um, and unlike any of the other sites. So um, one other question that we wanted to learn about was that was whether or not the amount of uh, additional nitrogen uh, removal stimulated by the presence of uh, any of these aquaculture sites was sufficient enough to be considered for nitrogen uh, management planning. And um, in uh, Waquite Bay, under our aquaculture sites, the nitrogen released uh, from the oyster aquaculture uh, is about 10% of the amount of nitrogen that's removed um, by the oyster biomass. And this may not sound like a lot to some people, but it's, uh, we think it is significant and it warrants uh, consideration in calculation of um, meeting your nitrogen uh, goals. So between August and September, approximately a kilogram of nitrogen was removed from under uh, all three of our, uh, each of our three sites, uh, which were again, as Dan and Vivian pointed out, only about 250 square meters. Um, and this is in comparison to 0.1 to 0.3 kilograms of nitrogen that, that's removed at the control site just uh, naturally um, you know, by naturally occurring, the same naturally occurring microbiota in, in the sediments. Um, the choice of gear uh, that one makes is going to depend on finding a balance between the different priorities that you have uh, and your, your objectives. The, these factors that are, that are at play in the ch choice of gear um, include the ease of management and the cost that Chuck uh, reviewed with you earlier um, in this presentation, the local hydrodynamics and the wind and wave uh, exposure which can affect your gear uh, choice because higher energy settings may damage your gear uh, that's more exposed to the wind and waves and uh, whether, uh, whether or not nitrogen removal is one of your priorities. If it is one of your priorities, um, the bottom cages produced slightly uh, more benefit in, in our, at our, in our Wakoit Bay setting, which, um, uh, but we don't, um, but the differences were not that significant and we don't necessarily recommend that gear type um, it, in all instances, particularly if your, if your site has sediments that are already very organic rich. Because what we saw at, at, at our site is the, um, the uptick of DNRA as a process under the bottom cage uh, site. 
And this is process is competing with denitrification. And so our nitrogen removal would have been even greater if DNRA hadn't been creeping up uh, underneath the bottom cages. And so um, the, um, the bottom cages, while they may be beneficial, okay, uh, they are not if the conditions go too sulfitic. And by too sulfitic, that's around two parts per million. So once you get above two parts per million, you're really favoring DNRA as a process uh, as opposed to denitrification. And if your sediments are already organic rich and approx approaching about seven to eight percent total organic carbon, the floating gear and the oyster grow gear may be better choices for nitrogen removal benefits. Um, in all cases, we think that what we found in this study, uh, evidence for the, the stimulation of DNRA when conditions go sulfitic and very stinky, and now we're circling back to the title of today's presentation, um, is that we don't want to go stinky, all right? If you're interested in, in nitrogen removal, you wanna keep your total organic content down uh, below seven to eight percent, and you want to keep your sulfide below about two parts per million if nitrogen removal is your priority. It's, an, it's a strong argument for rotating the location of your sites year to year because this allows uh, your site to flush a bit to clear some of the organic matter that naturally occurs from uh, the buildup of feces and pseudo feces and the accumulation of macroalgae from, from your system and uh, allows your, your site to recover and then you can move it back uh, into position. So uh, in terms of implications for science management, um, we learned that denitrification dominates in terms of nitrogen removal uh, over Animox, but it, it is possible with um, improper management to push the sediments toward DNRA if organic matter and sulfide accumulate too much. And this is counterproductive. The um, hydrodynamic setting that you have, uh, whether you have a high energy system that flushes uh, very with, the, all, with each tide or is exposed to high energy waves and wind, uh, the accumulation of organic matter will be uh, less of a concern. Um, your stocking density, if it's higher than what we have, um, as, as, as well as the aerial extent of your farm, will all affect the speed at which organic matter accumulates and, and the concentrations that, that do accumulate. Um, for choosing a site, uh, for optimal nitrogen removal, what we suggest is that you measure sulfide prior to your installation of your farm. And um, this is very inexpensive. You can do this easily with a typical Lamotte kit, which costs about two, $200. Um, and you measure organic, total organic matter content, which any number of local laboratories can do for approximately $20 a sample. Um, and then once your farm is installed, if you want to um, monitor whether you're maximizing your nitrogen removal benefits, uh, you can monitor sulfide and total organic matter a couple of times during your growing season to make sure you're staying in that sweet spot, that range where you can maximize denitrification. And again, um, consider rotating your sites year to year so that you don't uh, build up um, too much organic matter and sulfide. So in conclusion, um, you, uh, the nitrogen removal in the form of dinitrogen gas was enhanced under three of the, uh, the aquaculture gear types that we tested. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll remind people that our, our aim with this study, there are many things to study regarding aquaculture and nitrogen removal. Our aim was not to make any sort of a comparison between these gear types and say uh, 
uh, oyster reef systems. That's, that's outside the scope of this project. Our, our question was really whether we could see observable differences between gear types um, that were installed in the same hydrodynamic sitting, setting, the same proximity to shore, the same water depth, the same energy exposure, okay? Um, the bacterial community um, was not significantly altered in a negative way. Um, the differences in abundance of major groups was controlled by season and the, the uh, gear types did not have uh, an effect on that. Uh, relative to the control. And uh, what we saw in terms of the production of nitrogen gas from the sediments is consistent with what we saw with our, with our, uh, our, our gene expression uh, data. And we found that you can push the system towards the counterproductive process of DNRA um, if things go too stinky. And you can start to increase, in that case, the retention of nitrogen and decrease your nitrogen removal benefits. So with that, um, I think um, I'll stop and leave time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny and Dan and Vivian for that. Um thorough overview and walking through those nitrogen transformations and the role of the microorganisms all the way um, through. Um, the challenge we have now is that we're, we're pretty close to being out of time and we do wanna have some uh, time for questions. Here's how we're gonna manage this. We wanna be respectful of people's time because we asked you to take two hours and this is a challenge we have in sort of the virtual setting. We can't keep you for too long. Um, so we are going to all those questions that you have in the chat box, what we will do with our team, those that we will not get to and we know we won't get to all of them is to attempt to answer them and funnel those questions out. Some of them I saw that Dan was answering along the way there. So hopefully people had a chance to, to maybe look at that, but we'll, we'll condense that. We'll send it back out at a later date so you can have that. Um, we're gonna take um, time for the questions that we do have and I'm gonna try to queue up as many as we can. And if, you know, if one person put in multiple questions, I'll try to sort of spread it out so we get that. And I will ask for the audience participation if you could give us five extra minutes, if you are able, then we'll be able to get through a few of those. If you can stay, I would encourage you to do that, but we will wrap up at 1235. And um, if you can just give five minutes of your lunch break. So why don't we um, go back to, we have a, a slew of questions. Lori, may you, uh, you could you start with the one from Matt, please? And we'll just take those answers as quickly as we can. Sure, this is from Matt. Did you determine how many oysters were needed in Wakoit Bay or sections of the bay to bring it into TMDLs? Dan, would you like to take yeah. that? Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done the calculation to, to do that. Um, I, I, we could do that calculation. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Thank you for the question, Matt. Great question. Um, let's go to the next one from, I believe it's from Dale, Lori, if you're up there. I'm scrolling back up in the chat. I'll take that one. I found it. It looks like you may have some drift of organic matter from one treatment to another. Given their proximity, could this have influenced carbon in substrate under the suspended gear? Yes. Uh, so we did our best to isolate the system uh, within the constraints that we had. So the, the water depth we're working at here is a meter to about a meter and a half. Uh, at high tide. We separated these by, uh, I think it's five meters between the between each site. And so the without longshore currents, we don't think we had a ton of transfer from one to the other. But we also didn't sample along the edges of any of these farms. We went into the interiors of the farms because we don't wanna deal with the edge effects. We, we're trying to sample pretty much close to the center of each farm. So that we're getting the rain rate of that farm. Um, that's how we dealt with that, that problem. Thank you. Great question. Next one, um, Lori, can you take the question from Jeff? 
or any other question that you find. Lori, you're muted. Thank you for that, sorry. Um, why the difference between 2018 and 2019 in N2 release rates? Um, is it a temperature effect? Any indication of particle removal from the water column in or around the array? So to take the first question, uh, is there a difference between 2018 and 2019? For the most part, there isn't a significant difference between the two years. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the sediments, which leads to a lot of heterogeneity in the measurements, uh, a lot of variability in the measurement. And so if you look at the error bars, uh, if I compare the oyster, um, the bottom cages to the bottom cages year to year, uh, they're pretty close. We're looking at something like a two plus fold change in nitrogen release. There are a couple of, I'm looking over at the presentation, I'm not annoying people. Um, there are a couple of instances where that difference might actually be statistically significant. Um, but again, we don't, we don't have, our data can't quite um, reproduce that, that piece. So it's gonna always be heterogeneity in the sediments. Um, think if you get a bioturbator, if you get a clam or something in the, in the sediments, they're gonna pump oxygen into the sediments. And so we're gonna get some, some local changes. There's also changes season to season, year to year. Uh, 2019, we had a significant windstorm come through, I think in August. Uh, that's gonna affect things in the sediments. This is only, again, a meter deep at high tide uh, uh, to a meter and a half at high tide. So when that windstorm comes through, that physical uh, forcing is gonna pump oxygen into the sediments. We're gonna, we're gonna circulate our water around. So that's also gonna change, change a lot of our flux uh, data that we measure. Thank you. Um, we'll keep going. I'll try to take. Uh, is there another part to that question that I missed? Um, is there any indication of particle removal from the water column in and around the array? Particle removal. Uh, so we observed a couple of things. Uh, we had some sediment traps out and we can measure, we measured particle flux on, uh, or tried to measure particle flux on a 2018 season. It didn't work out too well. Uh, our, our, the movement of our system uh, played with our sediment traps quite a bit. Uh, and so we, we, we don't present that data. The, what our, we observe anecdotally is that we do tend to see in other systems that we work in, water start to become a little bit clearer. We worked in another uh, coastal pond uh, with, with Chuck's troop, and we did see the water start to uh, go from, you know, that hazy green color to, to a more natural water color. Uh, the other thing that we observed is that depending on which cage structure you, which, which aquaculture structure you use, we do see a difference in the following. Uh, so those bottom cages tended to retain a lot of the macroalgaes, and we could see all that flock around the cages. You can actually see it in the aerial image. You can see that haziness around where the bottom cages are. That's flocking material that's just sort of getting trapped by the physics of the system sitting on the bottom. Uh, so we do see things like that as well. Okay, we will take one last question and just in the queue as it is here. Um, Lori, would you like to read the question from Fred Wise, please? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tana Marie, I was scrolling down the bottom. I got it here. I'll okay. take it then. A pair, it appears that bottom cages have greatest impact on nitrogen removal. Would the removal be even greater if the oysters were not in cages, but rather just on the bottom without cages? Would the oyster removal, would the nitrogen removal be better if the oysters were on the bottom rather than in cages? Um, so again, being a chemist, I go right to what the removal rates would be, what the chemistry is going to change. If you put the oysters on the bottom and I ignore things like, uh, survivability, uh, I would assume they survive a little better if they're in a little protected baggie, uh, the nylon bags. Uh, again, I'm a chemist. I know very little about oysters. Um, if you put them on the bottom, what you ought to do is you ought to increase that transfer of carbon and nitrogen to the sediments. So you're gonna impact the sediments more. 
you might drive them sulfitic, resulting in DNA and storage of nitrogen, or you might stimulate nitrogen a little bit better. We, we did see that the, the bottom cages did stimulate nitrogen release a little bit better than the, than the floating or the midwater bags, principally because they're closer to the bottom. There's a more efficient transport. Um, Can I, I chime did, in there, Dan? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, they, they, the, the nitrogen removal was slightly higher under the bottom cages, okay? Uh, but I would not say so much higher under bottom cages that it's a strong argument to use them. And we, we see DNRA is more active under bottom cages. So if we had a third year of funding, which we did not have, and if we ran the experiment in a third year, I would predict we would start to see the two floating gear types uh, exceed the bottom gear in terms of nitrogen uh, removal because the sediments under our uh, bottom cage site were starting to go really stinky. They were not, you know, so a third year would have driven them more towards DNRA. Yeah. Thank you, team. Yeah. I think, Dan, you wanna wrap up? Just I just wanna see thought. if Chuck wanted to, if Christina wanted to add anything from the grower's side. Yep, so obviously there's uh, some more challenges uh, on the bottom, growing on the bottom from predation and survivability. Um, and also, uh, depending on the substrate that you're working in, overwintering the animals on the bottom as well. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we find locally in this area that it's a lot more difficult for us to grow them on the bottom throughout the year. Uh, our survivability drops way off. Um, mortality just goes through the roof. Uh, on the bottom. So uh, functionally wise, it would be a lot more difficult, um, even in an area like Wakoi Bay, where um, there's been, the system has been so degraded that you will have macroalgae push uh, all the way up to the northern part of the bay and just sit on the bottom. So. Awesome. Thank you guys so very much. Um, we do have to wrap it here just in the interest of time. And I want to thank those of you who stayed to the end and gave us a couple extra minutes. Um, as you can tell, we covered a lot of ground today, a lot of ground from farming to nitrogen to microbes to all of that stuff. We understand that this is a lot of rich and dense information and that people might want to sort of unpack that and digest it. It is very, very focused on this question of linking, you know, looking at shellfish agriculture with nitrogen remediation. We kept our eye on the ball in terms of management application. And I want to thank the team for all their presentations this morning. I want to thank the audience for your participation and your engagement and your questions. Um, just to wrap it here, we are producing and have uh, close to releasing some project resources for everyone to um, look at at their leisure. Um, the presentations and webinar recording from today will be made available on the Wakoit Bay Reserves website and we'll send that link out and let you know um, because you you are you registered for this we have your email address we'll be able to just um, funnel that information back out to you we're working on a best practice guide and we have about 10 project videos that have been done um, to link with that best practice guide that so you can we can package this information up in ways that can be easily digestible and read and referenced uh, scientific publication and we'll be um, storing all of those on the webinar website so look out um, for information from us in the coming weeks about where you can find this information and with that I'm going to quickly wrap it up thank you all for your engagement for your time please reach out to our team if you have additional questions and we'll do our best to send back out the responses to the questions that we did not get to today thanks and have a great afternoon and we are thankful that you, you chose to join us and learn about our project today. Have a great day.